this past week, we have been in the beautiful country of Switzerland attending a world conference on evangelism. Leaders from almost every part of the world have gathered to discuss the mission of the church in this critical hour. The church is beginning to wake up to the fact that we are an increasing minority surrounded by the hostile forces of communism and secularism. I've been gratified and encouraged that many denominations throughout the world are beginning to realize that if Christianity is to survive, the church will have to awaken out of its slumber and call for an unprecedented expansion through the means of evangelism. Not in 400 years has the church been so aware of the necessity of defining and implementing evangelism. The scripture warns us about the watchman who slept while the enemy scaled the wall of the city and the case of the shepherd who slept while evil teachers came in to lead the sheep astray. The Bible teaches the evil of sinful slumber. In the 32nd verse of the ninth chapter of Luke's gospel, we find these words. But Peter and they that were with him were heavy with sleep. And when they were awake, they saw his glory and the two men that stood with him. It seems incredible that the chosen three should be sleeping while with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. We do not know how much they missed that day when they were on the Mount. We do not know what a glorious view they missed because they were so sleepy. Today, the church is in danger of being put to sleep by the sedatives of worldliness and secularism. This week we have heard a call for a new depth of our commitment to Christ and a new dynamic in the evangelization of the world. A medical doctor said recently that America's number one disease is insomnia. He said this American disease has its effects in every area of our social and political life. He pointed out that at one of the world conferences held a few years ago that a former president of the United States could not sleep and as a result was so tired in the daytime that he could not make proper decisions and that America is suffering today from the fact that one man could not sleep. A Gallup poll of eight nations recently showed that Americans are the champion non-sleepers. 52% of the American people said that they had trouble going to sleep at night. Last year, Americans bought 3,360,000,000 sleeping pills, or an average of 24 for every American. The Reader's Digest, in a recent article entitled Sleep and How to Get More of It, gives some comfort by stating that insomnia has never killed anyone. But to people who suffer from it, insomnia is as weakening as anemia, as nagging as an ulcer, and as uncomfortable as the leg in a cast. Sleep is that unconsciousness which has been called nature's sweet restorer. Yet to millions, it is one of the most difficult goals in life to obtain. We are told that sleep is not a problem for earthworms, tadpoles, bears, or even monkeys, and only rarely for young babies. These lower forms of life lack intelligence required for insomnia. Today, I want to talk to thousands of you who have restless hours tossing on your pillows, praying for restful, soothing sleep that never comes. We found in Africa that witch doctors hold a mysterious spell over some Africans. The men of magic tell their superstitious followers that evil spirits dwell in every leaf and bush and bloom in the forest, and that there are evil spirits in the wild animals which roam the fields at night, that in the waterfall and in the flashes of lightning these evil beings dwell. As a result, the man whose mind is haunted with fear cannot sleep at night. As he hears the crying of the panther, the weird laughter of the jackal, he is startled into wakefulness. But we are told by missionaries that when Christ comes into his life, he can lie down in peaceful slumber no matter what is happening. Then the African can say with the psalmist, I will lay me down in peace and sleep, for thou, Lord, only makes me to dwell in safety. The story of David's flight is told in the Bible. As he fled from his palace in the dead of night with a few faithful followers to hide himself from the fury of his rebellious son. It was during this time of great sorrow that David penned the third and fourth psalms. And here in the eighth verse of the fourth psalm we find the basis for this message today. I will lay me down in peace and sleep. For thou, Lord, only makes me dwell in safety. I want to ask you a question. Do you sleep well at night? Or are you like thousands of others who suffer from insomnia? Millions are taking sleeping pills every night to help them sleep. It is becoming a national scandal and certainly endangering the health of thousands. There are certain elements that prevent sleep, so we're told. The first deadly foe of sleep is insecurity. 
Child psychologists tell young parents that their primary responsibility to their child is to make him feel secure. With world tension prevalent today, the children of men also suffer from insecurity. There is the international insecurity that we're all familiar with, but there are some things that are much closer home to us than even great world problems. There are financial worries that cause many to toss all night. Personal tragedy and sorrow trouble others. Others have fears that cause loss of sleep. But Isaiah said, And a man shall be a hiding place from the wind and a covered in the tempest as rivers of water in a dry place as the shadow of a great rock in a weary land. Isaiah was speaking of Christ. In other words, he was saying, give your life to Christ and he will give you a sense of security no matter what the circumstances are. The Bible teaches us that he gives inner serenity, peace and security. Today, all over the world, men are looking for security. There is no security outside of a personal knowledge of Jesus Christ. He can give you the security that will bring quietness, peace, and serenity to your heart. Secondly, there are many of you who have fallen into the snares of Satan, yielding to his temptations. A guilty conscience now haunts you through the hours of the day and often into the quietness of the night. Conscience has tremendous power to torment the transgressor. It has taken sleep from the eyes. It has caused men to sweat in agony. It has caused them to voluntarily give up secrets that have been buried in the grave for years. Rousseau declared in his old age that a sin committed in his youth still gave him sleepless nights. Charles II of Spain could not sleep unless he had in his room a confessor and two friars. Cardinal Buford, having slain the Duke of Gloucester, often in the night would say, away, away, why do you look at me so? Richard III, having slain his two nephews in the old tower, would sometimes in the night shout from his couch and clutch his sword, fighting specters. What made Adam and Eve hide? What made Cain cry out, my punishment is greater than I can bear? What made Ahab say to Elijah, hast thou found me, O mine enemy? What made Belshazzar's knees smite? What made Felix tremble? It was the power of a guilty conscience. There are hundreds of you listening to my voice at this moment who could not sleep well last night because of a lashing and guilty conscience. You cannot say with the psalmist, I will lay me down in peace and sleep. However, there is a cure for this disease of peaceless conscience. The Bible tells us that when you accept Christ as your Savior, that as far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. The Bible teaches that when you come to Christ, he takes your sins and buries them in the depths of the sea. And the Bible says that God forgets all about them. God is the only personality in the universe who can forget, and God has forgotten them. Now don't let the devil worry you about them when once you have accepted Christ. You can stifle that lashing conscience by a personal faith in Christ who forgives all sin. And then God will resensitize your conscience. Many of you have a hardened conscience. Your conscience no longer bothers you. You can sleep the sleep of a man that has gone so far in sin that God has given him up. But if you come to Jesus Christ even with a hard and cold and dull conscience, and receive him, your conscience becomes that of a little child again. It becomes a sensitive conscience. You can have your conscience resensitized by faith in Jesus Christ. Christ said to all of those who follow him, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. If you know Christ, memories of the sinful past will not haunt you, and the fears of the unknown future will not harass you. Then you can say with the psalmist, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore will not we fear, though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. And in these days of international tension, when none of us knows which way the world is going to go, what a wonderful thing to have peace in your heart, even though the mountains are removed and the earth blows up. You are safe at rest in God. There's a third element that prevents sleep. Many stay awake because of sickness. As long as we remain in these tabernacles of clay, we will be subject to physical frailties and menacing maladies. There are hundreds of you lying upon a sick bed who rolled and tossed last night. Your eyes are heavy, your whole body longs and cries for sleep, but the pain of your body prevents it. I urge you to match the pain of sickness with the presence of Christ. Martha Nicholson, the suffering portis, had lived a long while within the house of pain. All who had been privileged to call upon this sweet singer have not forgotten her hands. 
Anyone who has seen them has marveled at the beautifully expressive poetry penned by the painfully distorted hands of this one who has learned songs in the night. In recent years, her sensitive body has been pain smitten from the normal contact of the bed clothing. But from her bed of pain and suffering, she has prepared many poem pillows for the weary and the sick. Once, she said, it seems odd that I can thank God for sleeplessness. I have suffered so from it. And yet, looking back, I can see that some of the greatest blessings have come during the long nights. At about two in the morning, when all the world is quiet, God comes very close. Ah, you suffering saints of God today, remember the words of Jesus, Lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world. That pain or sickness that you are enduring at this moment is indeed an enemy of sleep. But if you will by faith touch the hem of Jesus' garment as the woman of old, and even though he deigns that the pain should remain with you, he will give you the strength and grace to bear it and will comfort you with his own presence. Remember that Paul had a thorn in the flesh, and he asked God three times to remove it, and God said, No, but my grace will be sufficient for you. In a recent article in Life magazine on this subject, it said that most of sleeplessness was caused by worry. Psychiatrists tell us that worry causes nightmares and night terrors in children, and it is the most frequent cause of sleepwalking and sleep talking. But today I have good news. The risen, reigning, returning Jesus who said, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. He is the one who is the same yesterday, today, and forever, the eternal Christ. All of you who are sick and fretful today can cast all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. He again said, take no thought for tomorrow. Again he said, fret not thyself. Again he said, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Some time ago, my wife and I were flying in a plane. We ran through one of the worst storms I've ever been in all my years of flying. Through the entire storm, my wife slept like a baby. Afterward, I asked her if she was conscious that there was a storm, and she said no. How glorious it is to be able to sleep through the storm. Can you say with the psalmist, I will lay me down in peace and sleep, for thou, Lord, makes me to dwell in safety? Ever since I can remember, I have had difficulty sleeping at night. This is a physiological problem inherited from my parents. Yet God has used this in my life as a stepping stone to deeper spiritual surrender. During many long wakeful hours, I've had the privilege of communing with God upon my bed. It has been in some of these sleepless hours that visions and dreams of what God could do in the field of evangelism have been imparted to me by the Holy Spirit. Some of the most effective sermons I've ever preached have been prepared in the night watches when everyone else was sleeping. The scripture says, thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. Psychologists tell us that we can train our subconscious. During the years, I've tried to train my subconscious to stay constantly on Christ. I've taken literally the promise of scripture and tried to keep my mind on him. And thus, there has been a peace that passeth all understanding in the midst of the storms and trials of the past few years. We need to remember also today that God is a holy God. There are thousands of you that are asleep and dull of hearing to the glory and majesty and holiness of God because of sin. But there are many of you also who are dull of hearing. Your soul has lost its sensitivity. Your heart has grown hard. Your eyes have become darkened. And Satan has blinded you to the glory of God's righteousness and holiness. In that sense, sleep has become sinful, dangerous, tragic, and disastrous to you. Others, like the disciples of old, are asleep to the agony of Jesus over a lost world. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus was agonizing for the world alone when the disciples slept. Today, the world is in trouble. The world stands on the threshold, perhaps, of a world war that could destroy civilization. And yet Christians are asleep. We have taken the drugs and sedatives of the devil, and it has put us to sleep to the dangers that we face as a world. America is also asleep. Christians in America are asleep to the fact that we may be on the verge of losing the freedoms that we have known as a nation. I urge you today as American citizens to arouse and to awake. I urge you in Canada and Australia, New Zealand and around the world to awake. We are standing at the point of no return. We need to awaken. We need to spend time in prayer. 
We need to spend time in holy living. We need to spend time in communing with God. We need to arouse ourselves from the slumber that Satan has caused us to be engaged in. I beg of you to awake. The heart of Christ must have been stabbed by the indifference of his own followers in the most crucial hour of his earthly ministry. There are many of you, however, that cannot condemn them until you've examined your own heart. Most of us will have to confess that we know little of sacrifice and little of genuine toil. We have not shared his sufferings and trials. Once again, we need to hear the challenge of Paul when he said, Awake thou that sleepest and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee life. Thousands of Christians are lolling in a sinful slumber here in Europe. Thousands of you in America, Australia, and Canada are asleep to the grand strategy of Satan for this age. Thousands of others are asleep to the fact that the only hope of our world is a return to personal faith in Christ. I urge you today, wherever you are, to put your faith and trust in him. Then you will be able to sing with the psalmist of old, I will lay me down in peace and sleep, for thou, Lord, only makest me to dwell in safety. Today, you can know the serenity and the joy of sleep and rest and relaxation by surrendering your life to Christ. Whatever the surroundings, environment, or circumstances, you can give your life to Christ today, and he can give you inward peace and relaxation. Shall we pray? Our Father and our God, we pray that the Holy Spirit will come into our hearts with that peace, joy, and serenity that brings about relaxation. Help us to remember the words of the psalmist that said, Relax in the Lord. Teach us to relax in Christ. Lord, thou hast promised that he will bring safety to us in the midst of difficulties, problems, and dangers. We pray for the peace that trust the safety that he has promised. We pray that we will come to know Christ as Savior today, that we may know peace with God and peace in our own hearts. For we ask it in his name. Amen.